Welcome everybody, Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. Welcome to Digital Domination Super Summit. This is where some of the smartest minds in tech share lessons, actionable tips to improve your business. I'm taking notes along the way. I'm the founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with successful entrepreneurs and leaders. Everyone who's live, put your name in there, where you're from, also put your questions throughout. I'm gonna check it and then we'll also break for even more questions at the end. Today's wonderful guest, we have Liam Martin. He's a co-founder of Staff.com, TimeDoctor.com. He's the master of systems, so it forces him to be productive. Thank you, Liam, so much for being here. Thanks a lot for having me. Now, the first question before we, you know, I'm really excited to hear your talk today. And, you know, basically for you, you are, obviously with staff.com and timedoctor.com, it's productivity, but you're going to talk about how to build a remote team, and that will allow all of us to be even more productive. And I remember talking to Marco earlier today, the co you know, the co-host of this, and he's like, I need to watch Liam's talk, and we all need this. And the first question before we go into the full presentation and the meet is I want you to talk about what was your inspiration behind uh, creating staff.com. You know, staff.com. Well, for us, uh, me and my co-founder Rob, I remember. I actually remember the day we decided to buy the domain staff.com. We were out in. Uh, we had rented an apartment in San Francisco. We were sitting out in the backyard, and we were looking at some of the competitors in the space of staffing of, of online uh, platforms. And they were all project based. So, um, and I mean, you probably know the big guys in this in this industry: Odesk, Elance, Freelancer, Guru. They all did projects. So, on those types of sites, you'd go out and get a website built, as an example. But you really couldn't get a web designer. And we had thirty plus employees. We had employed these people for years. Some people have been with us for over ten years, either through one of Rob's businesses or one of my businesses and we just combined both of those staffs together and we said to ourselves you know that's not the way that we do work uh, we want to have people that work long term that are real central parts of our organization they just work remotely and there's no platform to go out and get those types of people the biggest three biggest problems in staffing right now for remote staffing that is is how to find people how to manage them and track them and then how to pay them and those are the three biggest problems that we've solved at staff.com for long-term working relationships. And that's really the, the philosophical basis of where we want to you know, move this company and we want to move the ethic of remote work. We feel it's not just, you can't really, you, you can't have a career off of building $200 or $300 websites, but you can have a career if you're a web designer working for a company and you're just working from home. Yeah, yeah, and also I want to, um, give you a shout out for um, Liam. Not everyone knows this, but you've been sick for the past like 20 hours um, <laughs> and been sleeping off. And so, you know, I appreciate that you are actually making the time because I know you're, you know, you've been worn down the past day. I know I look kind of evil with my hoodie. <laughs> Um, and the reason why I have it on is because if I took it off, I would scare everyone. Um, I've been, <laughs> I've actually had a horrible flu. That's why I'll, I'll be sipping on tea throughout the, uh, throughout the rest of the presentation, simply because it's, it's uh, able to open up my throat. But uh, I wanted to make sure that I was here for this. I slept all day. I'm on a lot of painkillers slash, you know, very interesting drugs. So um, it should be great. Awesome. So what I'm going to do, Liam, I'm going to let you take over from here and uh, share your screen with us uh, with the presentation. And um, I'll just talk for a second while you uh, pull that up. And, um, and again, talking about how to build a remote team. And you're going to be talking about those problems, how, finding people so you can save time, energy, and money. So I'll let you take over from here. Okay, great. Am I all set? You're all set. Okay, so... <clears throat> Um, one of the biggest problems that I find with customers of ours, people that go on to staff.com and want to use our system and want to hire either their first remote employee or their second or third remote employee is um, systematization. So 
The biggest problem that, that we see is you really don't understand how to manage remote employees. And it's not that different from managing local employees, except remote employees are 10,000 miles away. So, you know, if you've got Johnny in your office and um, you are basically telling Johnny, uh, Johnny's not doing something correctly, <clears throat> you can just turn to him and say, well, here's how you do it correctly if he's in the office. But if he's 10,000 miles away, it's a very different process. Um, it's a process that requires to basically get you uh, a collection of documents, digitize those documents, operationalize them, give them out to your team on every particular function within your business. Um, so we're really going to be focusing on that. Once you actually build this type of system, this is usually what, I mean, any Fortune 500 will have these types of systems in place. The issue is that most small to medium businesses, home offices, you know, small offices don't have these systems in place. And it really does make you a better um, employee, a better, or sorry, a better employer, a better boss, a better business once you get these in place. They do take a while, but once you've actually got them set, um, you'll be off to the races. So, as said, as we say here, the, the big promise that you're really going to get is you're going to learn how to find and hire remote staff to build your business and then operationalize those systems. And uh, let's just get started. <clears throat> so, first off, quick little reminder why you should listen to me. So, my background, um, my name is Leah Martin. I'm co-founder of Staff.com and TimeDoctor.com. Uh, we have 40 plus employees in nine different countries and we specialize in remote long-term employee management. So for us, staff.com and Time Doctor, Time Doctor is actually a time tracking application. So we used, uh, and we're currently pretty much the market leader in that space right now. Um, what we use that tech, what that technology allows you to do is get any remote employee and see how productive they are during their work day. So what are they spending their time doing? What websites are they on? Um, what software are they using? How is their time being spent during their work day? So it allows you to basically provide the same level of oversight and management that you would for a local employee in your office. And that is actually the engine that runs staff.com, so it's a central part. Once you actually hire somebody, you'll be using the Time Doctor tracking technology within staff.com to be able to manage your employees. So for us, as I had said before, we had 40 different employees in nine different countries. Um, I, think, I think actually when we decided to start staff, we had 30, and now we might actually be up to 50. I don't remember the exact uh, number at this point, but it's been a huge ride and all of those people have been long-term employees with us. So we haven't had anybody um, that's been with us for a particular small project because we need those people for the long term. We, we need people that are web designers, not just people to build websites for us. We need them to update the website. We need them to do split testing. We need them to basically be a central part of the team moving forward. And that's really why we built staff.com because we feel like that's a major, that is a part of the market for online staffing that hasn't really been paid attention to until now. So let me actually just jump forward here. Um, I want to talk about three major issues in remote work. Okay, this is really the triumvirate of problems when it comes to finding remote employees. And whether you're looking for somebody for project work or for task work or for long-term work, I'm going to be going over all of those because you might not be the person that needs a long-term employment. Uh, you may be someone that just needs a couple small tasks done or someone for 10 hours. And in that case, we're going to go over where to find that as well. But all of those hires have these three problems in common, which is finding people, managing people, and paying people. So finding people, where are those employees, right? It's uh, that's a huge issue. It's a it's a huge issue. Yeah, I, I mean it's and it's one of those problems that we've been um, we've actually had significant problems with that as well. We're actually trying to hire a remote tester at this point, and I think we've done at this point 400 interviews to be wow. able to find a new a new tester. Now, I mean, we have a <laughs> since we specialize in staffing, we make sure that we find the best guy in the world. Actually, one funny little story is um, we just got one of the developers that I believe got eighth or seventh place in the Facebook hackathon last year. 
Wow. So this How did you and, find and, them? Well, I guess that's the question. <laughs> it's a very funny story, right? So we find this guy. Um, he shows up on our database. We interview him. We test him. We have a process that we go through, and anyone that goes on to SAP.com can have access to the same process. We give it away for free. Um, so th this guy is top, top tier developer, and <clears throat> um, Facebook offers him a job. Uh, I'm sure that probably Apple offered him a job, and I'm sure probably Google offered him a job. However, we got him for, I believe it was 2500 to 3500 a month um, because he didn't want to leave his country of origin. He didn't want to go down and work in Silicon Valley. Uh, and they all would have required him to actually just pick up and go down to Silicon Valley, even though he probably would have been making at minimum 150,000 a year working down there. So there's a huge there's a huge workforce right now that just doesn't want to leave their you know their 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 place of uh, sorry where they grew up. Uh, they want to stay where they are, and you know paying them as an example 2,500 a month when the average salary there is 500 a month. Well, they're doing fantastically well as well. So it's a win for the employee and it's a win for the employer. And the only real problem is, number one, <laughs> finding those particular people. So I'm going to go through three major... So how did you find him? So what we actually had, uh, we have a network of recruiters all over the planet that basically touch base with all of the meetup groups and all of the um, all of the little network mixers that are happening in the developing world, and we actually fund a lot of these at a really uh, really low price for us, and that's how we get that top tier talent. So we're out there in the trenches, literally talking to people, grabbing them, saying, "Hey, you know, you should sign up for staff.com. It would be fantastic." We help them sign up. Um, we actually call those types of people unicorns. So. Um, you know, a lot of <laughs> a lot of employers will come in to staff.com and say, "Okay, I need somebody who has six years experience as a designer and ten years experience in Ruby on Rails." And that's what I would call a unicorn because they don't exist, or they're so ridiculously rare that you know it's one in a million. Um, but to find those unicorns, if you can actually supply that that customer with that type of person then they'll end up hiring five or six other people from you because they're so excited about finding that great employee. Uh, so with those people, they, that person basically jumped into our uh, network through those platforms, through those recruiters. We put out the call, um, we use our network, and then we also use our own database and we use a couple other things like LinkedIn, <clears throat> um, a couple other platforms as well to be able to get those employees uh, in there and, uh, and, and hopefully working for us or working for somebody else, um, you know, in the company. Uh, or sorry, one of our other clients. So that, that's how that person was found. I mean, I guess that's why people come to you because obviously, you know, you have high-level high people uh, who, who can help them. Um, and, and with that, you're gonna, I know you're going to go into you know, finding great people, and I know you have a, a really specific process for once you find them, hiring them. Like you said, you have 400 applicants uh, for a position. Once you're talking about the finding, I'd love to hear just a few best practices for hiring because you have to sift through so many of these applications. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, that's something that we're always doing, and it's it's actually something that we, to a degree, take care of at staff.com. So we'll have uh, we'll have a job posting that'll be posted, and then we'll actually look through those applications on your behalf. Uh, so we'll do a 15-minute call with you and figure out, hey, wh what do I? And again, you don't have to go to us. You can. I'm going to teach you how to do this without necessarily using staff.com, but I'm just suggesting our process as well. So we go out, maybe we get 150, 200 applic applications for the particular job posting that you've put up, and then we refine those to three to four people that we think are the right fit. And we present those three to four people for you. In some cases, we'll even give you one to two people. And um, usually, they'll uh, generally, you've got about a 25% chance that you're going to hire one of those first three people 
and that's very high um, in our industry and that's just because we've spent the time actually filtering through that database and then only giving you the people that we think are the absolute right fit so you don't have to waste your time going through those applications but mm -hmm. I'll show you strategies for that as well so okay. finding people three first of all you want to figure out what type of work you want to be doing okay so is it task work is it project work or is it long-term work so for task work that's really um, doing very, very small tasks that won't necessarily take that long to accomplish and won't require any significant skill set. So as an example, describing an image. So let's say you want to have a, me a meta description for an image. That's the best, a best example of what I would call task work. Um, going a little bit higher, maybe you need someone to do a quick voiceover for a 30 second ad or maybe you need somebody to um, correct an image, right? Maybe you need somebody to correct a Photoshop image, as an example. That's where task work, if you need that type of work done, task work is where you're going to want to uh, set yourself up. And there are really two big platforms that are good for that right now, and that's Mechanical Turk and Fiverr. So I'll describe both both of these different platforms. Mechanical Turk is a basically a task outsourcing, crowdsourcing API that was built by Amazon. And was, when Amazon was first building up its platform, it's one of the largest, I think it is the largest e-commerce platform in the world. And they needed to do a massive amount of work. Um, they want, Describing images, writing descriptions for different products, absolutely everything under the sun. So what they did is they actually built an outsourcing platform called Mechanical Turk and they would put up bids for work. So let's say describing an image as an example, which is something that they have to do all the time in, in Amazon. Uh, they would have all those different they would have all those different employees basically bid on that particular on that piece of work and then they would just describe images all day long. Uh, very boring work, but you know if you're if you're in a developing country where the average income is two dollars a day and all of a sudden Mechanical Turk is offering you ten dollars a day and you get to work from you know a, an office and just describe these images all day long it's pretty good work so what they did is once they finished using it for themselves they opened up the platform to everyone else so there's an, actually a lot of platforms that are built off of Mechanical Turk Crowdflower is the perfect example of that um, to be able to allow you to use their crowdsourced network of workers to get a lot of work done. So that's that's the first example for task work. The second one is five. I feel like that doesn't about. get talked about enough, Mechanical Turk. People oh, skip over it such, all the time. So very interesting story, how we chose uh, staff.com as our domain name. We had about 20 different ideas for domain names. Um, and when you buy a top level domain, like staff.com, it's a significant investment. Um, we're it's talking, huge. yeah, a, we're, we're six figure minimum investment um, to be able to, to do something like this. Um, so we had to figure out okay, what are we going to, yeah, staff.com sounds cool, but you know, other names sound cool too, and some of these are super cheap, and some of them are really expensive do we really want to invest this much money into you know X product X uh, piece of real estate domain real estate so what we did is we took the 20 top names and we put them into Mechanical Turk and the way that the hit was set up which is basically what they call a task on Mechanical Turk is uh, you would go to the first page and the page would say read these domain names so you'd read the whole domain names and then you'd click next and then it would say what do you remember and it randomly placed those those domain names every single time so it reorganized the list and then we just basically asked them what do you remember and then they would write out what they remember and then that data would be basically coalesced into a report so we could figure out what had the biggest sticking rate and staff.com I think had like a 4x sticking rate in comparison to everything else. Mm -hmm. So that's we just moved unbelievable. from that perspective. Yeah, and I mean that, that's that's how we just basically chose the domain name. Uh, we actually, so not many people know this is, and it's, I think it still exists. Uh, we started with mystaff.com, um, and 
you know, when we compared that to staff.com, the stick rate was just out of the water. Uh, so we knew, hey, you know, if we've got the capital, let's make the investment now, and then long term, we'll be much more powerful from a brand perspective down the road. And, and Mechanical Turk, it cost us, oh, I think, maybe $9 wow. <laughs> to be able to do this survey. Um, and, and that $9, you know, made uh, basically made a us... A six-figure decision. Yeah, it made a six-figure decision, which was, uh, which was pretty crazy. Wow. That's one of the best stories I've heard in a long time, Liam. Yeah, it's, it's a Mechanical Turk is great, and the other thing too is if you really want, if, if your platform is based off of small tasks, so I used to run a tutoring company, and I'd have essays corrected on Mechanical Turk for two dollars, and you know I'd be able to turn that same corrected essay around for twenty to thirty dollars for the client. Um, and the great thing about it is that it's an unlimited workforce. So whether I had only one or two um, postings coming in or 5,000, I can still have the capacity to take on those extra corrections. And for anybody that really knows how it works, I, I highly suggest you check it out. Definitely, it, it's a little bit difficult, which is why there's a lot of platforms that actually just overlay their API, because Mechanical Turk has a great API. But um, for anybody that's really interested in doing large-scale crowdsourcing, Mechanical Turk is the best platform mm -hmm. for it. What platforms overlay it so people can check them out? Because I've tried Mechanical Turk and I've used it, and it is really sometimes tough to navigate. So I would go with Crowdflower. Um, you know, we use Mechanical Turk directly, but mm -hmm. I've heard a lot of great things about Crowdflower. And um, I think they've, they've really figured out how to get past that that difficult component that a lot of people run into. I mean, for, for Amazon, they re, they literally just opened it up. It's it's almost like their, you know, their server system. It's almost like Amazon S3. They're basically yeah. just saying, listen, we're putting this out here. You can use it if you want. Figure it out. If you, even if you don't use it, we're still making money. So, thank you very much. That's that's basically their philosophy. I think towards everything. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of overlays right now that work, but Crowdflower is what I've heard is, is the best. Great. Um, so Fiverr is the other one, and it's more for advanced task work. So uh, Fiverr.com is basically a website that started out where you could get anything done for $5. And uh, you'll get everything from, I will write you a 300-word essay to I will uh, dance around naked with you know my hair on fire for on, on video or something like that for five dollars anything and everything can be put up on Fiverr and uh, now they've actually evolved to uh, ten dollar tasks twenty dollar tasks hundred dollar tasks so it's it's only for particular tasks that you want completed and um, it's a great platform we've used it quite a bit actually I, I've, I used it about two or three months ago for a bumper for a video, uh, like a beginning bumper and end bumper for videos. And if you, we don't want to hire a developer, or sorry, a graphic artist to be able to do that stuff that specializes in video. We've already got graphics designers, but they specialize in Photoshop and everything else. So we didn't want to hire an employee. We just wanted basically one little thing done. And Fiverr is a great place to be able to do that. Um, yeah, I've used it many times, and it's just remarkable what you can get done on that site. Yeah, and the beautiful barrier to entry for it is it costs five bucks. So even if you don't get a good product back, um, it's five bucks. <laughs> it's one of those things that everyone can just, you know, everyone has five dollars in their pocket to be able to try out. So uh, the next category is project work, and that's really for the people that want an, an actual project completed. So a website completed, uh, let's say you need a book translated, let's say you need um, someone to write you a book, build you a piece of software, but do no more than that. Project work, or sorry, the project work category is the place for you. And there's really, there's a couple big competitors there, uh, or, you know, people in that space. The biggest ones would be Odesk and Elance, and then there's also Freelancer and Guru.com. Um, and those are all .coms. So Odesk.com and Elance.com, in essence, the same thing. What you do is you post your job, you get people that um, basically bid on that particular job, 
and then you interview those candidates and at the end of the day you figure out okay I want to go with uh, I want to go with with Jeremy he's gonna build me a great website and uh, you would go on from that point and you would have particular milestones that you would meet and then you would have cash you basically have cash milestones associated with each of those um, points in the project so that's a great you know great platform if you just want one particular project put together I would say it's probably the best way to go yeah I definitely have always leaned lean towards Odesk as opposed to any of the others because I've tried them mm -hmm. yeah and it, to me I would say the same thing I think that Odesk is probably the best platform out of those four however I mean there's advantages to uh, to all of those different platforms definitely and then the last category is long-term work and that's really where you get into uh, we, we define ourselves as an online staffing agency so um, I would define Odesk and Elance as basically project platforms and Chemical Turk and Fiverr as task platforms we're a long-term staffing agency or we're an online staffing agency so if you're looking for those types of employees uh, the two biggest places that I would look for them is either on staff.com or on LinkedIn. Um, staff.com, <clears throat> again, if you want to, you know, if even if you want to integrate LinkedIn and staff.com together, that's another thing that, you know, if you find the person on, on LinkedIn and you want to bring them to staff.com, that's fine. And honestly, if you find them on staff.com and you just want to work off platform, um, that's fine as well, just based off of the way that our business put together. But staff.com is really for long-term remote employees, so you're going to find them on, on our platform. Then you're going to hire them and manage them using our time tracking technology, and then you're going to do payments um, at the end. And the same thing with LinkedIn, except it doesn't actually have the management technology or the payment technology. So LinkedIn usually is for local hires. However, there is a huge component now. I believe last year, 35% of memberships, or sorry, of uh, profiles on LinkedIn were from the developing world. So you're wow. seeing a huge amount of, uh, of companies outside of um, or sorry, a huge amount of empl employees outside of North America and Europe that are jumping on LinkedIn because they know that that's where the great jobs are. And to be honest with you, the internet is evolving. <laughs> so you know, ten years ago, you really couldn't have what we have right now. We're you know we're doing this Google Hangout and we can broadcast it anywhere in the world, and tens of thousands of people can watch this broadcast if they want in 1080p probably you couldn't have done that 10 years ago and that's another reason why the developing world is really getting on these platforms because the barriers to entry are so much lower now than they were a decade ago yeah and let me ask you a question about stabs.com um, sure. as you were talking I'm pulling it up it's a beautiful looking site anyone should check it out just for the purpose of how everything's laid out um, and it's amazing you could you these are full-time people and like I'm seeing you know this person is for 5.35 an hour and it kind of ranges up but um, is there a minimum people have to do or how does that work? So we have a minimum on our platform of uh, 80 hours per month which is part part time mm -hmm. and most of our employees we want them to do 160 hours a month which is full time 40 hours mm -hmm. a week. Um, we really we're trying to get people jobs that's that's our core philosophy and not just in the developing world but in North America as well um, we hire people from the US all the time uh, we hire people from Canada all the time from Europe all the time and uh, you know you'll have somebody in rural United States who's maybe in a town of 5,000 people but is a fantastic Ruby on Rails developer and that guy doesn't want to work in Silicon Valley um, he wants to work in his own little town well, he'd be very happy to work for fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year instead of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year in San Francisco. And oh, by the way, he's probably making more money relative to his living conditions. Right, the living 000. expenses are huge. Exactly. In San Francisco. Yeah. So a lot of these guys just want to work that way, and and we allow them to do that as well. Um, basically, flow through that process. So for us, it's for with long term work, we are seeing a lot more. Um, Western employees coming into the platform as opposed to other platforms that you know are really looking for the
the lowest common denominator. And the, the other component as well is with these long-term employee agreements, um, and it's a month-to-month -month agreement, so you can basically terminate employment of that employee uh, within a month. The, the employees say, okay, well, I'm just only going to work for you, so I'll work at a discount in comparison to working as a contractor because I know where my next meal is coming from. I know that every single month I'm going to be getting a paycheck, and, uh, and that puts them a lot more at ease. Much and more really, stable. Yeah. It, yeah, and the other thing, too, is it, I mean, they're a partner to help build the company with you as opposed to someone who's getting a task done or a project done. Um, and again, they both have projects and tasks, both have their places, uh, just as much as long-term work does. Yeah, I mean, but these are people you've vetted already, right? Exactly. So yeah. everybody that you're going to get, a sh like if you're going to get a short list from us, we've spoken to them before. So we've actually gotten on the phone and called them. Uh, it's a manual process, but for us, we just feel like... It's your um, reputation. It's our reputation, and the other thing, too, is we have a 25% higher rate based off of interviews. And that's long-term. That's not yeah. just, like, for one task. So for us, it's really a lot, like, we feel we want to make sure that you've got the right fit as an employee. Ideally, the first employee we send you is the one that you should hire. <laughs> that's our philosophy. Because, and if we haven't done that, then we're doing something wrong with the process. Yeah, I mean, there's just looks like some uh, unbelievable people with experience on this um, mm -hmm. that is just much less than what you'd get locally. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, all right. Jump on to the next one here. Um, so really you want to define, this is an, um, further on point to defining your needs. There's four main areas that you're going to look for talent. And I'm going to define these four main areas so that you don't, you're not looking in the wrong places for the wrong people or for the right people. Um, so for outsourcing, you're going to look at Southeast Asia, India, actually uh, Eastern Europe as well, and North America. Looks like I don't have Eastern Europe in there. So Southeast Asia, India, Eastern Europe, and North America are your four main spots that you're going to look for. Southeast Asia is primarily going to be the Philippines. Um, there are a few other countries as well, but Southeast Asia, Philippines is where you're going to find people that can speak fantastic English, um, in most cases better than me, and they will be... You speak Canadian English. I, I speak Canadian English, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about the aboots. Uh, so Fi Philippines, great place for employees that can speak fantastic English if you need customer service, if you need um, virtual assistance, if you need people that are just going to help you with writing, that's where you'll want to go. And the prices are quite competitive. Um, they have been going up, which is actually a, that is a part of, I think, outsourcing, is that these countries are actually developing their economies through remote work so much that the prices are going up. So um, when I started, you could probably get somebody for around $200 a month. Um, and now you're full looking time? at... Full-time, yeah. Wow. And now you're probably looking at... Uh, the, uh, the lowest that will go on our platform is $500 a month. Um, I think the average, the average income in the Philippines is about $250 a month. So we make sure that those employees are really getting a comfortable environment so they can... You know, they've got their own home office, they've got a computer, they've got stability, so that you are just incredibly happy. And to be honest with you, $500 a month is, um, you can't compete against that. That's, un else. that's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and it's particularly the quality of work. Um, you know, you can get people cheaper in other countries. I think Africa is a really interesting country that I think once we get high-speed internet to it will be amazing. Um, but the quality of work isn't there. So one, you know, the Philippines can't be beat for English-speaking um, employees that are just doing great work when it comes to customer service. Most credit card companies now, um, you know, when you call them up, it's usually somebody from the Philippines who's answering that phone. And, and sometimes you don't even know. because No, you're uh, exactly right. Because I remember, because I've talked to you and because I've listened to you in the past, I remember I was, I don't know if it was United or American or, or one of the airlines, and I was talking and I kind of got that sense that it wasn't a U.S. person, they spoke 
absolutely perfect English, and we got to talking, and sure enough, they were in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and it's easily um, most of the most of the world's customer service is coming out of the Philippines right now, um, and ironically, most of these people are probably being paid two hundred to two hundred fifty dollars a month to do those customer service positions, and for you. If you're just, let's say you're hiring your first virtual assistant, grab that person that's been working for United for five years, pull them out of that job, pay them double. They will be incredibly loyal to you, and you know, you'll be able to just build your empire um, off of these people because they've just been, it's a win for you and it's a win for them long term. Now I'm going to have to figure out what airline so I can call them and take them away. Yeah, I've actually tried to do that a few times. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's kind of funny. They, uh, you know, they'll say, "Oh yeah," I, I said, "Well, you know, I'm I'm working at, I work at this company called Staff.com. You know, you should really check it out. And and here's my email address. And you know, some of them get really freaked out because all of the calls are recorded. Um, uh. So they never want to be, you know, caught on caught on uh, the the phone being recorded and saying, "Yeah, I'd love to work for you guys," because they might get fired. But um, yeah, great. Place the best place actually in the Philippines for customer service people is um, Cebu, uh, which is uh, there's Manila, that's the main capital, the biggest city in the Philippines, and then Cebu is great. There's a lot of SEO people and a lot of customer service people that have been trained there over the last 10 to 20 years by large Fortune 500 companies, and um, there's a lot of talent right there that you can pick up. So the other countries, uh, India, India is really good for your mid to top tier programmers. Um, India is a great spot if you just need a deliverable completed. So, you know, if you need a milestone based project done, that's a great place to go. Um, a lot of BPO companies, which is, which is uh, called business process outsourcing companies are in India. So they'll have a team of let's say 20 or 30 people that will come together and build a particular project out for you. That's, that's the place to go if you need that particular type of work done. Um, India, I find they're not as long term as Southeast Asia and Eastern Europe and North America. I think it's just a cultural thing that they jump around quite a bit. But um, some fantastic developers. The prices have gone up recently. Um, you used to be able to get people for 500 ish a month, and now they're at about 1500 to $2,000 a month. So still cheaper than North America, but not necessarily by much um, in comparison. You'll be able to find someone that's quite good there for probably four to 5000 and someone who's just starting out for about 1000 to 1500 a month when it comes to development. And then Eastern Europe, um, those are where you're going to find, to be honest with you, some of the best developers in the world. Um, the biggest secret that you know a lot of Silicon Valley has is that uh, a lot of their hires are not out of the Silicon Valley, they're out of Eastern Europe. We have um, a pretty large team in Eastern Europe, and when I say Eastern Europe, I'm talking about Romania, Ukraine, Russia. And you'll have ex USSR guys that will have PhDs in mathematics or computer programming, computer science, and you'll be able to get them for about three to four thousand dollars per month, which isn't necessary. I mean, you could find developers in North America for three to four thousand dollars per month, but you can't find people with PhDs in mathematics and computer science for three to four thousand dollars per month. We actually had a guy recently who was hired. Um, out of Ukraine, and he worked on the uh, the Russian missile systems um, in uh, you know in in um, in uh, the, the USSR. So right. he worked on like the nuclear weapons <laughs> for uh, for the Someone USSR. Someone you you want to get on his good side? Uh, yeah, I mean a genius, right? Like he, I think he was at one point. I think he was in charge of the Ukrainian space agency at one point and now he's working for this guy you know um, in, in uh, one of our clients so amazing amazing um, talent that you can get out there and very competitive prices in comparison to the talent that you're getting so I would say some of those people are really um, 
are really just going to be absolutely amazing. Let me just quit Skype. Yeah, here. I'll let you uh, <laughs> get on there. But I just uh, as a side, as you get that up here. But yeah. um, I just remember, I think it was who was I talking to? Um, There's a big company here in Chicago, and they use like all Lithuanian. I think it was Lithuanian developers, yeah. like a developing team out of Lithuania. Yeah, Ch uh, Czech. Um, Czech Republic is another big place too. Italy is another growth uh, industry as well for us. I mean, we find people from all over the world, or oh, sorry, all over Eastern Europe that are just really good developers. They don't necessarily want to leave their hometowns, um, and they want to keep. They they want to work the way they want to work. And uh, the other great thing about it is as well is they'll work on the hours that you know you. There's a lot of overlap between. Western hours, North American hours, <clears throat> and Eastern Europe hours, Eastern European hours. So you'll be able to see a lot of hours of overlap happening where you can work together. Whereas in the Philippines, it's a 12-hour flip. So 8 a.m. is 8 p.m. in the Philippines. So you have to kind of plan out your day, figure out what you need to send out to those employees, uh, you know, at night as an example, and then they'll take over the night shift and work at night for you. Or they work the day shift as well, but that's, that's neither here nor there. And then the last category is uh, North America. So North America is great for project managers, developers, basically the people that are going to run the system for you. Um, they have a, outside of any other place, they have the get it done type of attitude that you would need in, a, in order to have somebody managing processes. So, I mean, we have uh, probably about a quarter of our staff are sourced out of North America, and that includes customer service people, sales people, developers. Um, we have, as I said before, employees in nine different countries. Uh, great place if you're looking for fantastic project managers, people that just can kind of get shit done. <laughs> I guess you, this is the best way to define it. And um, the pl the pockets that I would look for are uh, Middle America. Stay out of you know stay out of basically New York and San Francisco, Los Angeles, and you're gonna be in a pretty good spot for remote work because you'll be able to get those people at a significant discount to top tier talent that you would find in San Francisco or New York. As in, I mean, I would probably you. If you've got somebody in, uh, let's say Omaha as an example, a top tier developer there is probably going to be seventy thousand dollars. Whereas if that same developer is in San Francisco or the Valley, you're going to double that at minimum. Wow. Um, and you want to be able, you'll be able to get the same type of talent remotely for half the price. Um, for me, I would absolutely go for that every single time, as long as you know how to manage the process adequately. Yeah. So, um, job description. Let's let's touch on that for a little while. So, it's really less about finding people, and it's more about filtering people out. So, when we put up job descriptions, we really ask ourselves, okay, what do we not want in this employee? Right. A lot of people ask, like, hey, what do you know? We they need six years experience in this or five years experience in that. And that's a, that's a good way of going about it. But for us, we really, since you're you're going to get so many applications in, um, you want to be able to, and we at staff.com handle that for you. But if you're doing it yourself, let's say you have 400 applications coming in. Well, you want to be able to figure out who who mits who who do we really want moving forward? Do we want the guy that has uh, I don't know somebody who is, let's say I'm looking for somebody who has five years experience in Ruby on Rails development. Do I really want the guy who just has five years, is, is that a hard cutoff date or do I want the guy that has four years of Ruby on Rails develop it, development but for the last four years has been working for Shopify as an example which is one of the best Ruby on Rails platforms uh, projects you know on the internet. Do I, I would absolutely want that guy. So for me, it's more about... It's hard to just, put that, yeah, like what if he's amazing and he has three and a half years, then you're losing right. that on that. Yeah, so for us, we really, um, we work on testing as one of the biggest components and paying attention. The first test that we do is what we call the Apple test, or actually what I call the Apple test. 
And um, so I'll put in, in the middle of my job application, the word Apple. And I'll just say, <clears throat> uh, or sorry, I'll put in a line saying, you know, if you've uh, read this application correctly, put Apple in your title when you email me back your application. And if they haven't put Apple in, I actually do a Gmail filter for Apple. And then when I have new applicants that come in, if they don't have Apple in their title, then I know that they actually haven't read through the, the job application. So I can automatically filter those people out. Because if they not taking the time to actually read through the entire job posting, then they're probably not people that want to work in the company. We need people that, are, that will read instructions um, intently and then follow those instructions properly. So that's one tip that we have that easily cuts out about 80% of the people that you know, are, are coming into the company. And we really kind of leave it open. Like We don't say five years experience in Ruby on Rails. We say we need guys with Ruby on Rails experience and then in that job description I'll put in the little Apple line and maybe the guys that are really good at development don't put that line in. Well, guess what? I don't need you in the first place because you're not somebody that just focuses, that doesn't connect to our yeah. company culture. Yeah, it's like a tripwire, and if they're not meticulous with reading that, how meticulous are they going to be with uh, the code? Absolutely. Yeah. And I can tell you from personal experience, we had a bit of a server explosion about three or four days ago where I had to sit on email till 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, apologizing for people to people for the server being on offline. If you have, <laughs> if if there's a problem um, with your developers, it's it's not just you know it's a huge problem for the rest of the company. They really are the basis of if you're running a tech startup. They really are the basis of your organization, and they need to be have a ridiculous attention to detail. Um, mm -hmm. And you know the Apple test is a perfect example of that. That's a great one. So, interview process, um, we have three qualities to look for, and they actually are in this order. So it's action taken, reliability, and skill level. So I'm going to go through those very, very quickly. Um, action taken is just, can you actually take action without me necessarily being there to tell you what to do? Um, so when you're dealing with remote employees you're not they're not in your office so if they're just you know if, if someone's in your office you can just turn to them and say hey I need you to do this or I need you to do that and that that works out I mean it's not the best situation but you can still run a company with basically commanding employees on a face-to-face -face basis you can't do that remotely people in remote businesses have to see problems and then offensively take action, right? So basically say, okay, I'm going to go and solve this problem. And then in 12 hours, when my manager gets up, I'm going to report on the problem that occurred and the solution that we took to solve that problem. A perfect example is actually last week, the server going down. So um, our server went down and people were not able to get their reports. Um, and this is a big problem for us. I think we had this affected uh, 900 companies in our in our business, wow. and we had to take immediate action. Well, I was texted at 11:30 at night, and I did jump on. But by that point, we they had already taken action. They shut down the server. They you know they were figuring out what the problem was. They were restarting. Um, they were writing the bug fixes for it, and we were up and running in I think 30 minutes, or 30 or 40 minutes. But they took the action outside of me. So they weren't waiting for me to, to basically solve the problem or to give them permission to do what they needed to do. They simply just did it. And that's, those are the types of employees that we look for because particularly in remote businesses, um, there, are, it, there are eight hour gaps where there is no manager to make a decision. So you need to be able to make decisions on your own. Um, Reliability is the second one. So if you are not reliably showing up to work on a regular basis, if you're not doing the hours that you said that you were going to do, um, if you're just basically not passionate about the... I, I connect reliability to passion um, in the type of work that you're doing. 
then it's really not going to be a good fit for us and I think for most businesses. So you need somebody who's going to show up, you know, do eight hours a day or six hours a day and is going to be working day in, day out to be able to help build your business. And, you know, if they're not showing up on time, we have so many employees that we give them a chance to work for a client and uh, they show up to work, you know, three hours late, as an example. Automatic. You know, I'll tell clients, um, I'll, I'll, I usually touch base with them about a week after their hire and <clears throat> the employee uh, will have shown up to work three hours late for their first day and then the client will say, the employer will say, well, you know, he said that it was this problem or that problem and I'll say, and I, I still kind of like him and I said, you know what, I don't think that it's the right hire for you, I think we should fire him and find somebody else because reliability is so important when you're dealing with remote businesses. Um, if that employee, you know, let's say it's someone in the Philippines and I'm working till 9 p.m., but then that employee is getting up at 8 and is reporting to work for 8, well, that one hour overlap is where we're going to have a meeting. Yeah, and that could be the most productive time when you have to, you know, get all your points across. Exactly. I want to be able to communicate that information to that employee um, as quickly and efficiently as humanly possible. So reliability is, is definitely important uh, when it comes to that. And then, and then the third is skill level. So that's actually the least important quality to look for. Um, I can teach skill. I can't teach the ability to take action and the ability to, um, to be reliable. Uh, and actually, so a perfect example of this is a test that we did to find one of our graphic artists. So we had a, um, I had a test put together, and this is what I'm talking about when you say make a test. So you're going to make tests that basically test these three qualities. So we had a test, and it was a graphic. It was actually a coupon, um, like a $100 bill. And the, we wanted them to make three changes to this document. We said, hey, this is a PSD of, or this is a PSD file. We need you to make these three changes. We need you to change the color to green. We need you to change 100 to 50. And we need you to change the face from Abraham Lincoln to something else. Um, and I need it done in 12 hours. So that's a test for the graphic artist. And we said it was a .psd file. And for anybody that knows, that's a Photoshop file. It means that the actual, it's, it's a editable file. It hasn't collapsed into a single layer. So it's very easy to basically pull all those pieces apart. But we didn't send him, send those people a .psd. What we did is we sent them a .jpeg, which is not editable, right? Like basically you would have to manually go in and you can't pull the different pieces apart. You can't pull the different layers out of this doc, out of this, uh, this, this uh, image. Um, so there's three main results that we usually have from this process. Either one, they'll spend the next 12 hours editing that JPEG to make it look like a .psd. Or two, which is a better result, they will actually just recreate the PSD completely and that will take about six hours. Hmm. Or three, they'll email me back saying, excuse me, you sent me a .jpeg and you said you were going to send me a .psd. That's the guy that I hire. Because that's the, <laughs> that's the person who, number one, is not afraid to tell me I'm wrong. Right? They've taken action. They're reliably telling me when I've sc screwed up. And, you know, the, I don't really care about their skill level because I've seen all their portfolios before. Their portfolios are fantastic. We wouldn't have brought them to this, this uh, stage in the you know, in the hiring process had their portfolios not been good. So we're looking for people that can actually just tell us, hey, listen, I, this is wrong. I need you to change it um, so that I can do my job. Because otherwise, that pr when you're talking about a 12-hour difference, that graphic artist would have been working on that task for 12 hours. And then when you come back um, the next day, you'll say to yourself, okay, well, you could, it could have taken you five minutes had you just emailed me, because those changes literally take five minutes. Um, you know, you could have emailed me, said I sent you the wrong file, and I could have sent you the right one. But instead, you took 12 hours to complete this task. 
which is 12 hours that you know I didn't necessarily want to pay for as an employer so that for me is one of the best ways to think about those types of tests I don't necessarily use that one but think about those types of tests when you're gonna um, go ahead and hire these remote employees and yeah, I like that one so the, the third and last point is I would personally always hire more than one person to start and the reason why is because the interview process is really only about 10 to 20 percent of the of figuring out whether someone is the right fit and there's a lot of other organizations that do this um, I don't know if you know Zappos Jeremy but they have a great hiring philosophy they actually train their employees for a month and then uh, they offer them cash to leave so they'll say I have heard that yeah. yeah so I'll give you three or four grand if you can just walk away right now because they want people that are passionate about you know working for Zappos um, so they'll they'll offer the money to leave as opposed to continue to work for them it's kinda like a loyalty test and for us we always hire more than one person because we don't know whether or not that person on paper is going to do what they think they're gonna do in real life so you know someone may be fantastic in the interview they may have a fantastic resume but then when you get down to the nitty-gritty of it these employees just don't know what they're doing um, maybe they don't show up to work on time and I can't tell you the amount of times we've had people where the the employee who's cheaper is actually better than the employees more expensive we actually just for our automated testing um, tests that we ran uh, we found that two thousand dollar employees were doing better at the tests than six thousand dollar employees so you know it's it's really interesting that process and we don't know um, you just never know so to me it's hire them for a month have them do the same tasks look at the data see who's more reliable see who's able to take action um, basically see who's adding more to the business and then you can either um, hire both of them terminate one person and hire the other person on full-time or you know or even pass the other person on to another business associate of yours because maybe they are the really the right fit but you can't afford to you can't afford to hire two people you might as well just keep that other person close that's a big paradigm shift and I remember you know I, I follow you and what you say and, and all the information you put out um, on the on the web and when you said that I did that several times and it's just it's amazing it's a huge paradigm shift but you get those two or three people for the same job and then you also get two or three again and if it's a if it's a huge task it may not be affordable if it's a smaller task and you can do that you can afford it and you get two or three products also that you can choose from I mean yeah. that, that's essentially what like 99 designs does but in this case you're looking more for like maybe a longer term solution you have uh, two or three options and maybe two are good and you just end up going with two if it's if it's uh, within your budget yeah absolutely <clears throat> okay so trial stage so this is actually what I was talking about before which is implement real-world interviewing um, and and that's in essence what I what I mean by trying people out for a month so it's really important that you test those two people because someone may be this uh, sexy candidate at the beginning and the only the other thing that's actually really important to keep in mind is people that are really good at interviews may just be really good at interviews they may not be good at working at all um, I am fantastic at interviews but you would not want to hire me for your organization <laughs> I am I'm fantastic at interviews I actually I remember years ago I interviewed for this job and um, the guy you know and and I was working at my own business at that point I was doing some consulting work and this job was for uh, was a statistician job and uh, because my uh, my undergrad and grad school degree or graduate school degrees are in uh, sociology with a minor in statistics so I'm running I'm doing this interview the interview takes like two and a half hours the guy calls me back and says I don't want you as a statistician but I would love it if you were you know hired on to our marketing team to be able to do our online marketing at double the salary 
well, I started that job, and uh, I think it was fired within a month and a half because I just, it's just not a very, I'm, I'm a horrible, horrible employee. That's another reason why I started um, working as an entrepreneur and business owner is because I literally had no other choice. So why I were you fired? Oh, I think I was telling them what to do, and basically I just disagreed with what they were doing and wanted it to, done my way. Again, it's one of those things that if I don't, I have been fired or I've quit from every single job I've ever taken um, longer than three months. Within three months, I've either been fired or, or left every position. And it's just because I don't like people telling me what to do. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that I don't really know why <laughs> that is, but um, that's, just, that's just the reality of it. So some people are great on paper. I, and I, my resume probably looks great on paper. Um, it'd probably be great to hire me on paper, but in the real world, man, be I would a pain. Yeah, I, yeah, I would be such a pain. Um, unless you gave me complete freedom to do whatever the heck I wanted to do, um, I would be such a pain in your ass all day long. So this is why, you know, implement that real world interviewing, you'd be able to figure out the asses from the people that are just solid, reliable executors. Um, of you know of work and the other thing is during that first month I would suggest that you meet meet with them almost every day in the beginning to track their productivity and, and really compare metrics to, between employees so we do that through our, our management tech through time doctor um, you can do that through whatever means you know you have at your disposal um, for me, I meet with everybody. I have about five or six hours of meetings on Mondays, and we meet with every department um, on Monday, and that's just a touch base, figure out what their wins are, what their losses are, and then what their next rock task is going to be for that particular week. So how are they going to move the needle in the company for that particular week? And um, it's been, you know, that that's a great way to just touch base with the team, when you're, you know, when you have a real-world office um, with employees that show up to your office every day, you don't have to necessarily do that as much as you would with a remote team. But I think it's really important to be able to do it with a remote team. And we even have um, the managers of departments have five-minute scrums every single day with their employees to be able to figure out exactly what they're going to do during the day, uh, figure out what had happened yesterday, and what problems they have today um, with their goals. So particularly in the beginning, meet with them every day, and then whoever you're going to choose to move forward with, at least meet with them uh, once a week just to be able to touch base with them. Yeah. Okay, so um, what questions do you guys have for me? I guess right. is the next, we'll, next slide yeah, here. So we'll go to some of the live questions, but before before you go off and yep. come back in as you, just tell people where they can find out more information. Just reiterate the sites um, they should you know check out. Sure. So staff.com and timedoctor.com. My personal email address is liam at staff.com. Um, if you're interested in working with us, Sleem at staff.com. If you just want more information, email me personally. Um, I'll be able to get back to everybody. Maybe not today because I'm probably going to pass out at the end of this interview and go back into my little cocoon. But um, you know, I'll be able to get back to you within the next 24 hours. And uh, yeah, so you know, those are the those are our two companies. I'm more than happy to talk with anybody as well. Um, even a, you know, if you want to do formal calls with me. I don't know if you've been using this, Jeremy, but I find that Clarity is a great platform. I have you, I've played around a little bit with it, yeah. Yeah, it's a great platform. I've been using that quite a bit as well, and I've, I've been uh, having a ton of fun on that platform. So, But easiest way to get in contact with me is Liam at staff.com. Yeah. That's very generous of you. Um, I'll have you come out, come back in, and uh, there's several questions that uh, people have already put in throughout that uh, I'm going to ask. And then as you go out and come back in, um, you leave the call and uh, come back as you. I'm going to actually just reiterate a little bit some of the highlights of of your talk uh, that you went okay. through. Yeah, so, yeah. So as uh, Liam goes out, comes back in, um, 
that was phenomenal. There were some of the resources which I wrote down, which was uh, Crowdflower, obviously, Staff.com, um, and Odesk, Elance, Fiverr, Mechanical Turk, um, and you know, most people know about LinkedIn. But um, some of the main points, you know, he obviously went really in depth with the three major issues, which first of all, finding people, sometimes just finding people, uh, good people for a specific task. Um, and managing the people and it, some of those hiring processes some to weed out because you can get through 300 or 400 applicants but weeding them out initially with his Apple test was just huge and I love what he talked about that and then some of the the upsides to the different areas uh, when you defined your needs and um, I liked what he said about the job description you know he doesn't you know he kind of went the um, contrarian view, which is most people say what they want, and they say you know what they don't want, or put in that test to weed people out, which is the Apple test. And with their interview process, um, you know, a lot of times we look at skill level, and you know they, what they look for is first of all action um, taken, the reliability, and then skill level, and the action taken. They have they have a test for each of them. So to reiterate, when he talked about the action, you know, he talked about when that action is taken, you know, they gave them the wrong file. And they had to actually ask and take action right away so they're not wasting time. So put those some of those systems in place. Um, and Liam is back, and so I'm going to actually um, pull up some of these questions here. And the, one of the questions, um, Liam, was specifically about Time Doctor. And they wanted to know about, is it integrated with social apps? And it sounds like this person, um, if, they're a, if, if your work is related to social, uh, how do you use it if your work is related to social marketing management? Well, so our app does monitor every website and application that you're using. So if you are playing World of Warcraft, we're going to be able to track that data and know, hey, you were playing World of Warcraft for three hours. But what happens is there's a little pop-up that pops up in about 30 seconds after you do something that we define as unproductive work. And it will say, were you working, are you working on email? Right, that might be your task. And if you say yes, or you might say, are you working on social media marketing? Yes, I'm on Facebook. It will leave you alone after that. And then you just continue on with your day and do what you need to do. Um, we've found for us, you know, there are people that do social media marketing as an example. They just click on that yes, and they're uh, they're relatively, you know, they're they're fine. They can just continue on with their work and and do whatever they need to do. So, what do you find for yourself to be the biggest time suck where you find that thing keeps popping up because you're on a different site? You know what? I think for me. Um, it's probably it's probably Facebook, but the beauty of it is, I'll pop onto Facebook, and I'll be on for 30 seconds because I know the timer fires in 30 seconds. It's one of those things that I can jump in, and I'll just like <laughs> you I'll, beat I'll just, the system. Well, I'll just literally I'll think to myself mentally, okay, I have 30 seconds to be on Facebook, and then I got to get off because it's that heroin that you're on every day. You need that hit. So um, yeah, for me. I just jump on 30 seconds and try to beat the clock and then get off before that pop-up starts. Um, it's, it's just such a great, I mean, for me personally, using the software, I actually had, uh, when you visualize your data and you see how productive you are over time. Um, and it shows you that. It shows you that, yeah. So I found a huge drop on Tuesdays. I wasn't doing anything on Tuesdays. Tuesday afternoon specifically. And I thought to myself, why is that? Well, on Tuesdays, I usually go out for Tuesday, app, Tuesday uh, movies, cheap movie night. What happens? People start calling me. People start calling me, ask me what's coming up. I go and check, you know, I, I check the, the movie sites, all those types of things. And um, it's just one of those issues that. I'm just ridiculously unproductive during those times. So, you know, with that, we just solve the... Basically, what I do now is I don't uh, go to work... Or, sorry, I work um, throughout the... Uh, I work throughout the... Uh, sorry, I do not work on Tuesday afternoons. Got it. So, yeah. Um, that makes sense. Um, so, 
the other question was, I'm going to try and sift through, um, about Time Doctor. And yeah. they asked, is there any encryption for company data and how do you manage workers' privacy? Um, sorry, could you say that question one more time? The first one was, it says about Time Doctor. Yep. Um, it says, is there any encryption for company data and how do you manage workers' privacy? I'm not so, sure exactly yes, what they the mean by it, but... Yeah. The, the information's encrypted. Basically, it's it's anonymized and it's encrypted. So only the the only people that will have access to it is the administrator of that account and that particular employee. Now you can assign managers to actually have access to that data as well, um, but you know we don't have access to that data. This is actually something that we're debating right now. Is a very interesting extra feature since we have such granularity on data. Is we could show you the average employee's workday and how it compares to yours. Hmm. So we're looking at that as well and that would still be anonymized but I think it's something that would be incredibly useful to users because uh, there's so much, you know, there, there's, we have so much data now. I actually just I'm about to put out a blog post on, um, on uh, how unproductive Christmas and New Year's is. <laughs> in comparison to the rest of the, you know, the rest of the work uh, uh, yeah, month. Yeah. Because we have that data, right? I can show you. Or Thanksgiving. Oh, wow. Yeah. Where's the, where are those drops? Thanksgiving is horrible. About, I think we lose about half of our, of our work data for Thanksgiving. Like literally goes down by half. And the funny thing is Christmas goes down by half, comes right back up. New Year's goes down by half. And then only it goes back by like 20%. Next week, it just slowly curves back up. And I think the reason is is that people have just had way too much to drink and you know they're trying to get back into that flow over the next two or three days so that we it's really cool now because we've got you know we track so we, we track hundreds of thousands of hours um, every single week that we have that granularity now and we can see okay what are the trends um, it's really interesting because we we'll probably I don't know of another organization that has that type of granularity on their data. So we could do a lot of cool stuff and we're debating it in the company right now whether we would open that up on an anonymous basis so that uh, you know, your, the individual employers or employees can have access to that type of data. So on that note, what is the most productive day or section of the week? So, I mean, for me personally, and I can only talk for myself and my company because we don't have access to anyone else's data, um, Mondays between 10 and 12 are really my most productive hours. And you can see that trend as well when you look at the data. Um, you can see when everyone else's 10 o'clock starts. That's when everybody's, you know, they've gotten past the hey, hellos and all those types of things. and you'll also be able to see some people that put in 10 to 11 hour days versus the people that put in 8 hour days and they're just absolutely um, you'll be able to see their productivity versus what they actually put out every day very interesting metrics um, the average worker in an office has about 3 hours of productive work per day that's pretty sad right? Um, it's pretty sad it's pretty bad and to be honest with you I would rather, I have this philosophy of saying, listen, if you've done three hours of productive work, go home. Like, just forget about it, because you're not going to get much done more than three hours of productive work. So just, you know, you, you could spend better time doing something else. Go home, do something else, take a, like the, you know, European siesta as an example, and then come back a lot more energized than, uh, than, than when you started, so. And... You know, Liam, I just want to thank you because you've been so generous with your time. So I have one last question for you. Sure. And it kind of goes along those lines, which is, you know, we talked a lot about hiring, um, the process, finding people. What about, you have so many, so many staff. How do you be a good boss? Besides letting them leave after three hours and nap the you rest of what? the day. I, I think it's... Um... That's a really hard question because I don't know if I am, to be honest with you. Um, I would say figure out... I mean, there's been people who've been with you for years and years and years. Yeah. So, so in that situation, you have to be doing something right, um, you know, the so data to back that up. I would feel uh, there's, um, 
there's a book that I just read by Peter Drucker called The Effective Executive. I've actually read it twice now. And he suggests sitting down with all the different employees that you manage and asking them, what's holding you back from completing what you need to complete? And sometimes that might be you. So understanding, um, being the person that just facilitates the process instead of controlling the process, I think is really important. Saying, wh what can I do to help you accomplish your goals? Does that mean not bothering you anymore? Maybe. Does that mean giving you more resources? Does that mean you know, focusing your, you on one particular task? That's what I would really, I, I think that Peter Drucker, the effective executive, I have only read it, you know, the last three or four months. Um, it's the same book that's given out to, I believe, most Google executives once they become an executive. And uh, I very rarely read through a book twice, and I have a ton of notes on it. It's a great read. So, you know, the last year, actually, as we've grown, um, I've seen myself change from an entrepreneur into an executive and I'm trying to go through that process now and I know that that might not sound incredibly sexy to a lot of people but it really is a big change for me whereas before I was doing things and now I'm having people do things and I'm not actually doing stuff and that transfers a really interesting process. Yeah. Yeah. So for people listening, would you just repeat the title again from the Peter Drucker the, book? The Effective Executive. Got it. Thank you so much, Liam. I really appreciate it. Everyone should check out staff.com uh, and timedoctor.com. It's always a pleasure, Liam. See you later.